recording. It's recording over here. Is it recording over here? It's recording over there too. Excellent. Here, there, and everywhere. E I E I O. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of What We Didn't Say on Sunday. My name is Jordan Massey. I'm here with David Chauncey, and we are here to share with you our sermon leftovers. Every Sunday, we preach at Westside, and when we do, there are things we don't get to, things left on the cutting room floor. And the purpose of this podcast is for us to share with you those things, to let you know what we didn't say on Sunday. Well, hey, Pastor David. Good afternoon, Jordan. How was that pronunciation? You did beautifully today. All right. All right. I'm glad. I, I like to see that you can still learn and I'm grow as a person. Humble. I submit myself to my pastor. You tell me however you want me to say your last name. Yeah. And I will do it. Yeah. David. Do you say it Chauncey. that way when I'm not around? Do you say it the old way? I, I actually, when you're not around, I say Chancy. <laughs> <laughs> Just to make me mad. But you're not around, so you can't. But I'm not mad. around. That's right. Well, uh, hey, was it a good Sunday at Newberry Road? It's always a good Sunday. You know, people showed up. There we we go. worshiped. We sang. We opened God's word. It's awesome. We we were looking at a lot this Sunday. Oh man! I mean, I don't know what you covered at Newberry Road. I, I tried to cover eight, nine, fifteen, and sixteen. The seven trumpets and the seven bowls. And uh, I would boy. not recommend that. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> that, that was not easy. I'm not sure I did it justice, but we have our reasons we can explain to That's folks. right. Uh, so we have, a, I think, a, probably a lot to get to a number of things that we didn't share on Sunday, but we'll begin with a sermon recap. I don't, my sermon was 45 minutes long. Man. Just way longer than normal. I don't know how I'm going to do this in three minutes or less, but I'm going to let you go first, like always. So uh, every time and we mine was forty five minutes as usual. <laughs> so <laughs> excellent. All right. <laughs> hey, every time we record this podcast, we want you to know what we did say on Sunday before we talk to you about what we didn't say, and we do that by giving a three minute sermon recap. And Pastor David, you're going to go first. So, in three minutes or less, tell us what you did say on Sunday. All right. So the title of my message was The Great Tribulation. And we're seeing this incredible unfolding of the seals of God. And we come toward uh, chapter eight and nine, where we see the seventh seal opened. And coming out of the seven seals, we see uh, at first a silence. Hmm. And I guess uh, John had his iPhone watch on or something. He knew it was 30 minutes. He said half an hour. about a half an hour. And then the angels come out with trumpets. And so it was what we tried to cover uh, were all of the judgments. Basically, this the seven seals moving into the seven trumpets, moving into the seven bowls there in chapter 15 and 16. And um, I, stopped, I started with basically looking at this entire tribulation is the day of the Lord. Hmm. It's the day of the Lord that it, the scripture's been telling us. Over and over again, the mm. day of the Lord is coming, mm. and this is the day of the Lord. And I started with an illustration of how when I, my brother and I were misbehaving, uh, she'd send my mom would send us to her room and say, "Your dad's coming. When he comes <laughs> home, he's going to handle this." Mm. And so we lived in dread of him coming home. Mm. Now, when we had been good, we couldn't wait for him to get home. <laughs> That's but right. There are days that we did not want Daddy to come home, and when he did come home, he had to bring discipline well eventually the day of the lord will come Mm. and he has to bring justice and we saw in chapter eight the heavenly prompting of his coming with this uh, the prayers of the saints the opening of the seven seals and i talked a lot about these prayers being um thy kingdom come uh hallowed be thy name uh how long O lord all these wonderful prayers we've heard uh in scripture god is answering those prayers uh, by bringing the day of the Lord. And then we, I looked at the work of the Savior, uh, Jesus' his picture of him intercessing for us in heaven and lifting those prayers to the Father. And so that was the prompting uh, that has to happen, that is happening. And then, uh, then we looked at the process, the unfolding of God's final judgment. And I looked at four sevens, the seven years, hmm. the seven 
uh, seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven plagues, all in one point on my sermon. <laughs> uh, we went through all of those and unfolded some of them, and I just showed that it was a divine, perfect, complete plan with all of the number sevens indicating and pointing to the plagues of Egypt and pointing to the seven trumpets of Jericho and how the walls fell and how God is just showing us he will one day uh, inflict on us and inflict on us the ecological, political, financial, spiritual, emotional, eternal, all sorts of these seeds of wickedness that we've sown as humanity will come to full fruition and we'll reap what we've sown mm. through these judgments. And then I talked about daily implications mm. of God's final judgment. And I read from Revelation 14, two verses, and I know I'm done. But let me give you my application. There's, there's, you know, can, there's grace. There's grace, especially on a week like this. Uh, week. Yes, and uh, that we need. And and my point, my main point that I repeated, hopefully not enough, but through the entire, is we need to live every day with his, his day in mind. Mm. Live every day with his day in mind. To pray with his day in mind. Mm-hmm. To obey with his day in mind, and to reach others and to reach the nations with this day in mind, uh, because. He's coming. Hmm. He will come. Yeah. All right. So that's it. That's great. That was how long? I, I eclipsed 40 minutes, somewhere between 40, 45 minutes. Okay. And, uh, but I'm sure, Bo, that it went by so fast for you. It felt like 15. Exactly. Wow. You wanted more. It was so engaging. Yes. <laughs> Bo, it's always so sincere when <laughs> I prompt him. I could hear it I in his prompt voice. him yeah. <laughs> to say that. All right, well, uh, here's my three-minute sermon right. recap, what I did say on Sunday. I didn't have a main idea. Wow. Because it was an atypical Sunday for me. I didn't tell a story at the beginning. I didn't have a main idea. There was just too much to get to. And so uh, we just looked at 8, 9, 15, 16, and just wanted to help our people not think about God's judgment as the elephant in the room, that it, it should be something that we are excited about. And mm-hmm. something that we're not ashamed of, that we're, we're mm-hmm. proud of our God, that he's a God who is just. And and so we looked at these four chapters and, and talked about what is God's judgment and just tried to answer that question from these four chapters. And so the first thing, we just went in order. It wasn't logical, like a logical order or building, just an order of the text. The first thing, God's judgment is a response to prayer. And we saw that, as you pointed out, at the beginning of eight, the prayers go up. And from that, everything that transpires seems to be a response to to that. Mm. So God's judgment is a response to prayer. Secondly, God's judgment is a response to injustice. What What's the content of those prayers? We see in Revelation 6 and uh, verse 9 through 11, under the altar there are the saints who mm. are crying out, how long, O Lord? And so every how long prayer will one day be answered, and God will respond to every injustice and every evil, and that's something we should be glad about and and hope for. Uh, The third thing was that God's judgment is a natural consequence of sin and evil, and made it clear that that's in two parts. The first part in that God's judgment is the righteous response to sin and evil. And this is the affirmation in chapter 16, it is what they deserve, is what uh, the, the angel declares. It is what they deserve, that this is what we deserve for our sin. This is what we deserve for evil. But secondly, in that it's the natural end of evil. This is where evil ends up, in that evil and sin undo creation. And that's what we see happening in these judgments, this unfolding of creation completely being undone. Fourthly, I think I'm on fourthly, we, we talked about how God's judgment is, um, it, it comes at the end of every chance being given for repentance. And there's this reoccurring, they, they did not repent, they did not repent, they did not repent. Also, we talked about how God's judgment is definite, and that these this angel with, I think it's the, the army of the horses with lion heads, the angels prepared for the hour, the month, the day, the year. It's this precise moment. And then last but not least, that God's judgment is good. And that's overwhelmingly the point, that it it's born out of his holiness, that we don't have to be ashamed of this and think God can't be good and also do these things. In fact, that the opposite is true, that if these things don't happen, then that means God isn't good. Um, so uh, I won't even get to my application because I'm out of time. 
But I, I did have a few points of application just to say, hey, here's how we should live in, in light of this. Mm-hmm. But man, that took a while. Yeah, yeah. It's a big chunk to to bite off all of those things. And I think you're resisting and and I am resisting going too long in this series um, explaining each one of these judgments, mm-hmm. each one of the trumpets, each one of the vials, each one of those, when a lot of them are overlapping and repetitive. Yeah. Uh, we have stars falling. We have them affecting the sea, have them affecting freshwater. And I liked looking at them more this Sunday. And what I left on the cutting room floor that I wish I'd spent more time doing was showing how they overlapped. Mm-hmm. Not that they happened necessarily at the same time, but that they they were intensifications of, of harming the same general areas of our life, mm-hmm. ecological harm. Uh, I think it's very interesting. Like you said, it's our sin is currently right now harming our environment. Mm-hmm. It's it's harming our bodies. It's harming the trees, the grass. I mean, it's just uh, – and so the answer for – kind of modern scientific theory is to, and I was reading some of this the other day, is get rid of humans. Mm. I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah. That humans need to go extinct mm. for the sake of the planet. And so it's interesting that atheistic uh, people are coming up to the same issue we have. People are the problem. Mm. But instead of destroying all the people, why don't we save them? Mm. Why don't we do something to redeem them? And that's what this – revelation does is it does redeem those and renew and transform people but there has to be justice that is coming because it's we reap what we sow yeah and i guess at the bottom of my message was that it's not arbitrary judgment on god's point it is a reaping of what we have sown hmm. with much grace being given for all of these years uh and and i loved your point um And it's kind of where I begin is the holiness and goodness of God requires this. And we shouldn't be ashamed of that. Mm. Um, So good, good sermon. Thank you. You had there. Yeah. It didn't feel, there were moments of it that felt like a sermon. Some of it felt more like a a lecture, Uh a teaching on doctrine. But. um, And that's hard on a Sunday morning too, because, and nowadays people will give us two or three times a month. Yeah. You know, we don't, it's hard to build week by week and, uh, and it's a challenge sometimes to know how teachy to be versus preachy and how to, how to bring this together for a diverse group on a Sunday morning yeah. of first timers, long timers, you know. And, and thinking about, uh, and this will really transition well into sermon bloopers and I'll go first, uh, but thinking about first time guests. You're always concerned on a on a day where you're you're taking this magnifying glass to God's wrath mm-hmm. and judgment, and even I don't know if you got into a conversation about hell, but we did because it it seemed necessary to discuss that final judgment, that mm-hmm. eternal judgment. And uh, I I will say part of me was like, man, I wish you were here another Sunday, yeah. <laughs> like for your first yeah. time. But then there's another check in my spirit of, like, do I actually believe and trust that God's Word does not return void? And that if we preach God's Word, whatever portion of God's Word it is, that it will sanctify believers and call unbelievers to salvation. And and so there's a check. The blooper for me, honestly, is not this sermon, but looking at kind of the scope of my preaching up until this moment and thinking... I don't think I preach on God's judgment enough, Mm -hmm. and we shy away from it. For us, I began with this just this idea of the elephant in the room, and I think for me, in certain moments in my personal life, in my evangelism ministry, also in my in my ministry uh, from the pulpit, that I've also treated it like the elephant in the Mm -hmm. room and kind of shied Mm -hmm. away from it. And and the reality is that without it, the gospel is is flimsy. It's it's shallow. That without a proper understanding of God's judgment, we we can't truly understand the beauty of of the gospel. And so 
Uh, there was a little bit of, I guess this is kind of a serious yeah. blooper, yeah. but uh, just so our people know, like uh, we're in process, we're working through this. I'm certainly in process mm-hmm. more than you are. I've only been preaching for a few years now. And in reflection, looking back and thinking, not that I want to be a you know, hell, fire, and brimstone preacher, mm-hmm. but I think there have been moments where I've shied away from mm-hmm. the topic when I, I shouldn't have. Yeah. So. No, that's that's it is a, it's it's hard to make some of those judgment calls, but I, I'm feeling sitting here somewhat under conviction that uh, who am I to decide what part of God's word mm. God's people should not hear? Mm. <laughs> you yeah. know, mm-hmm. and I skipped over a bunch this week, mm-hmm. uh, making that decision for them. Yeah. Now, I can kind of justify it, but they may not understand. It would take me a while to justify it, mm-hmm. in, you know, to, to help them understand these seven seals, trumpets, I think, are saying the same thing. So we didn't divvy them up and walk through them one by one. We feel yeah. like they're all giving one big picture. And they trust us, I think, our, our, our church members trust us to make some of those decisions but I think we should always handle the, the, the word with reverence yeah. that the word uh, needs to be taught and heard, all of it. And um, let's not uh, kind of clip the parts out that we feel maybe aren't necessary. Sure. It's because we have a high regard for Scripture. Yeah. It's all inspired, but sometimes we might make a call. Yeah. Uh, maybe that – well, we got to be careful doing that. <laughs> yeah. But to be fair, I mean, that's what we're doing every week. Yes. Right? We're making a call on this is the word for the week. Right. And uh, and we, w- you and I both have this perspective of ministry isn't on a Sunday. It's not in a moment, but it's the long haul of mm-hmm. ministry and mm-hmm. faithfulness. And um, that, you know, people aren't going to fully understand Revelation 8, 9, 15, 16 because of your one sermon right. on it. Right. Right. And so we're always making that kind of call. I think we have to. I don't to. understand it after my sermon on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> understand it less. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but I understand that that check. I think that's a good check to have. That we always need yeah. to be mindful of that. And but we have to rightly divide the word. Yeah. You know, and we study to do that. Yeah. Exactly. And so we're held responsible for that. And uh, besides, we have the podcast. And the podcast. And all of our people listen to the podcast. Almost. <laughs> It's right, a growing though, that's audience. What the numbers are we showing, just right? need 12 more people. <laughs> yes. All right, you 12. <laughs> All right, uh, any any sermon bloopers for you? Um, no. I, I, well, I did. I, I used an illustration about my dad coming home, and it was a good illustration, I thought, of the, the fear kind of of – he wasn't abusive or anything like, but there was just this. We didn't. We knew when he came home, we were going to be in trouble. Yeah. And I, my son, uh, when we got home, he's twenty. My young son, he said, hey, "It's a good sermon, Dad." And he he's really serious. He says, it's "A good sermon." But he goes, uh, "At any point during your sermon, did you ever become uncomfortable calling God Daddy?" And I got to thinking about it. Uh, I did. I kept saying, Daddy's coming home. Daddy's coming home. (laughs) And I got to thinking about it. Maybe I should have backed off calling God Daddy so many times. I certainly didn't mean that disrespectfully. Uh, But when you're 20-year-old, questions. Yeah. Yeah. Questions that did. And he said it so nicely. That was so kind of him. It was kind of him. Did you ever at any point become uncomfortable? Yeah. Continually calling God Daddy. Yeah. <laughs> but God, Jesus called him Abba, yeah. Father. Yeah. You know, and some people pray dad, pray to him and call him Daddy. Yeah. I, I well, don't. how do you feel about that? <laughs> um, I know it's hard for me not to laugh when yeah. someone prays and addresses God as yeah, Daddy. Yeah, it's, a little, it's not normal. It's not usual. Maybe, that's probably my immaturity. Probably. If I'm laughing, it's normally because of my immaturity and not someone else's. That's true. That's true. <laughs> All right. Well, um, hey, let's continue with what we didn't say on Sunday and, and think about historical context. And man, oh, man, there's there's so much here going on, especially when we're dealing with four chapters that, that we didn't get into. And I'll just begin with, with two things. 
the first one I didn't I just I actually read uh, I didn't read all of it but I read some and I read the portion about wormwood yeah and I didn't deal at all with what does that mean that this star is called wormwood and I think the the kind of plain reading is that there was a a shrub that was called wormwood that you would grind and put in uh, in a drink as a poison like it would kill you mm-hmm. and and so it's just simply this idea that the water's poisoned, right? That, that I think that's what the, mm-hmm. the main idea is. But I don't know if there's anyone else saying, why is it a proper noun? What's going on there? I didn't deal with any of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, we just read over the, the bottomless pit. <laughs> yeah, I, I read that because I wanted to point out this idea about the locusts, that the locusts having scorpion tails is this, this imagery of disordered creation that Locusts don't have scorpion tails. You ask, we, we have uh, one of the leading entomologists in the world at Westside, yeah. Rebecca Baldwin. You ask her, yeah. do, do, are there any locusts with scorpion tails? And she will tell no. you a resounding no. no. And so there's this disorder. In, in Genesis 1, each is according to its kind. That's, that's this re- reoccurring phrase. And here, this is not according to its kind. So I just read over the bottomless pit just yeah. to yeah. get to the locusts. And, and didn't deal with that at all. Um, and honestly, I, th- I think some of that, this is this is language that's unique to this chapter. There's a lot of that here. And so we don't have a ton to work with. It seems like the bottomless pit, whether it's hell itself um, or some other space where you don't want to be, th- the point is that evil is coming out right 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 and i think there's also this imagery of uh judgment being you know pouring from the sky and also coming out of the ground it's, mm. it's coming from mm. both directions but i didn't deal with the, the bottom and you know that's that's where the floods came from too yeah is the floods came from above and then they came out of the out of the ground yeah. in both directions and i i definitely see things falling from the sky and most of them have to do with with fire Mm -hmm. and things rather than rain and this is a different judgment than the flood and what's coming up are these spiritual entities whether they take the form of physical locusts or they're as i was kind of telling the congregation as some of our the the famous revelation commentators you know like the apocalyptic code and others see these as helicopters you know and that john's trying to describe future things that he's he can't even comprehend what a helicopter is Mm. shooting missiles out of its tail Mm. you and i can Mm. but to me i told the congregation i said it is it is fun to speculate on those things and i think that's okay because you may be maybe that's right we don't know but we do know there's a spiritual reality behind this Mm -hmm. And that God is, I, I use the, the illustration of stepping on an anthill mm. when you're a kid. You mm. know, you love to step on an anthill. Well, I, I love to do it now. Oh, a yeah. fire ant, you kick a fire, and it just, they just come. Oh, yeah. It's just, and one of the things that Revelation talks a lot about is God releasing things. Yeah. And I think we've sown the seeds of this judgment. Mm. He's held back mm-hmm. the demonic, the ecological. He has restrained uh, a lot of what we are due. And this this final tribulation is him removing that restraint. Mm-hmm. And John is seeing it symbolically. And we, we just don't know how symbolic it is. It's in a spiritual realm that the angelic beings are, are holding things tight until mm-hmm. until that day. And it's. What an act of grace it is that God hasn't let those millions and millions and millions of demonic locust creatures pester us. Already. Yeah. Yeah. Allowed us to enjoy life the way we have as mm-hmm. just his, his gracious providence on us. Yep. But we deserve the other, mm-hmm. the bottomless pit. Mm-hmm. And, and this would have spoken loudly to people in that historical context because they really saw the demonic being in these. If you go to Israel with me, we go to where Peter talked about um, uh, in that um, um, Caesarea Philippi. There's this hole 
in the ground mm. that uh, has water in it, and it's bottomless. Mm. They they can't find the bottom. Uh, ancient people couldn't, mm-hmm. and they put sacrifices in there. Mm. They believed that was a hole that led to Sheol. Mm. And so well, Sheol, Sheol, yeah, it's Sheol. If, if you want to be careful. <laughs> So this bottomless pit, you know, is unleashed, and here they come into our daily life, into our reality, mm. and we, we receive that kind of judgment. So uh, I left a lot of that kind of, I didn't talk about wormwood, I didn't talk about uh, the, the variety of things or the 200 million man uh, <laughs> army. With horses, with, with lion horses heads. and lion heads and, and all of those kind of things. Again, no matter how it manifests itself spiritually with a or maybe even with a physical army of from China. Mm. Uh, is that a is that a. Oh, that's a that's yeah. a that's an idea that the, the army from the east Got comes Got across it. the dried up Euphrates. Got it. And they could certainly feel the 200 million man army. Sure. And would have lots of reason to send them across uh, Iran and China and their buddies right now, mm. like they've never been before. Mm. Uh, and so you see all these coalitions, and you really can see how, in a very geopolitical, physical sense, a lot of the realities that we're the spiritual things that are depicted in Revelation, uh, I think, have their physical counterparts coming together right in front of us yeah we can see how these kind of things can happen in those days john couldn't couldn't have comprehended a number that big yeah that was far more than they could even yeah comprehend and i i think you're getting at and we we've we've returned to this tension over and over again but i think you're getting at something that we have to hold one side being that I believe the primary purpose of these images is not to give us a description of how God will bring judgment, but to emphasize the end result of his judgment. What is he going to accomplish? And and so even within some of that, we see, well, there's going to be torment. That is a part of the end result of these locusts is they're tormenting humans and humans want to die, and they can't die. Which, by the way, what a total inversion of the way things normally are, mm-hmm. where people long to live for as long as they can, and they die anyways. And now we have people who long to die, and they can't. All they can do is live. Um, but we have that where, again, the, we'll say primary, not exclusive, but the primary purpose being to emphasize the end result, the accomplishment, where... As, on the other side of that coin, I think that there is this reality that these are also things that are going to happen in history in some kind of way. And I talked to our people on Sunday about how Exodus is really meant to be the lens through which we read these uh, trumpets and bowls and plagues and all of this, that we're meant to see God liberating his people from Egypt through these plagues. And the Exodus... Those were historical things that happened in history. So I think using that, I don't think we can read these texts and just think, oh, this is all just symbolic. Yeah. There's something that's going to happen in history that correlates to these images. Mm -hmm. And yet we also need to realize that these images aren't meant to necessarily describe in detail the exact way in which these things are are going to happen. Yeah. I hope I'm making sense there, kind of. No, and if if you, it, and it makes sense if you understand what your role will be through all of this. Uh, is it necessary for me to understand who the two million people, men army is? That is not going to be a saving thought for anyone. Yeah, you know, but it is a it's a confirmation of of what God how God is going to do uh, and bring about these things is that He's using. He's using the world that we've kind of created through thousands of years of brokenness. Mm. He's using this world that we have actually twisted. Mm. You know, I don't know that he twists the locust and turns all. I mean, we've made um, 
uh, it's like the transgender issue that you have been talking about on Wednesday nights, Mm -hmm. where we have now decided that our identity is no longer biological. Mm. Our identity is what is psychological. Mm -hmm. And so I can actually be something that I'm not actually Mm. physically. Yeah. I just make that decision. And then we'll surgically alter something to match what your mind says rather than what your DNA says. Sure. So in a sense, we're kind of reversing yeah. creation. Yep. And that's what we get mm. in the end is a reversing of all of this craziness. Yep. And we get what we wanted. Freedom from God's constraints. Freedom from his design. Mm. And our design is crazy headed locusts yeah and uh, massive armies yeah and ecological disaster and mm-hmm. uh, all of those kind of things that we we tend to manufacture and we're trying our best I think as human beings we we try to find answers for it um, but we uh, sometimes our answers are even worse than our problems mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah I I Totally agree, and I think we go back to that original sin. It's that same disordering of creation that the serpent tempts them, deceives them that they will be, quote-unquote, like God. That in taking from that tree, they're making this decision to step outside of the created order. And I I said this on Sunday, it, it might be a blooper, I haven't totally... I don't know if I totally agree with what I said yet. I think I do. And I I made the point that what we see in Revelation 8, 9, 15, and 16 is what should have immediately happened Mm -hmm. at the moment that we sinned, that the total breakdown of God's good created order, that is the, should have been the immediate result. And we see some of that in Genesis 3 where God tells them in Genesis 2 that if you eat from this tree, you will surely die. In Genesis 3, they don't die. Right. Like, there's immediate provision. There's immediate grace. And humanity should have ended right then. And so every day of human history is a, a pouring out of God's grace. And um, so I don't know if, I'm, if, I'm totally, if I totally stand behind the, uh, the idea that this stuff should have happened right away. But I think there is there's some truth to that. And, um, but the point being that we, we look around at the world and I think we get overwhelmed. How can there be so much evil? How can there be so much suffering? How can there be so much pain? I think a biblical perspective actually lends us towards, wow, it's amazing there's not more. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> God is so gracious. The sun rose today. It shouldn't have. Uh, everything is so disordered and so chaotic. Um, so, anyways... Those are, those are just some thoughts. We're kind of, we've done some literary context already. That's technically the next segment of what we didn't say on Sunday, but we've already kind of been discussing that. Anything for you outside of, for me, Exodus is huge, right? They sing the song of Moses in Revelation 16. They pray at the beginning, God responds just like in Exodus 2. There's plagues that look just like the plagues in Egypt. Mm-hmm. So I think reading through the lens of the Exodus narrative is really, really helpful for understanding these texts. Anything else for you as far as literary context goes that you'd want to mention? Yeah, I wanted to pursue this, and I don't know what I think about it because I never really thought about it this way, but thinking of the plagues as connected to Exodus, then thinking of the trumpets as kind of a, a connection to Jericho. Mm. And then you've got the, the, the bowls of wrath where it intensifies even more is – Israel's history is really a, a reflection of a lot of things, and so you've got them released from Exodus, from Egypt, but then they're in the wilderness. They need their their goal is the Promised Land, mm-hmm. but to get into the Promised Land, they've got this massive city, Jericho, that is right there at the entrance mm. that they've got to deal with, mm-hmm. and God deals with them through their with that city through this obedient blowing of these trumpets. And then they get into the promised land and it is there that they need to deal with the inhabitants and they don't, you know, and, and I think there's maybe, maybe he wants us to see this entire journey leading towards the ultimate promised land Mm -hmm. 
the new heaven yeah. and the new earth where the river's flowing through. Yeah. And the river uh, flowing, the Jordan River is just the central part of that of New Testament story. Mm. You know, and and uh, so rivers and trees and all these things are critical to the garden. They're critical to Israel. They're critical to the new heaven and the new earth. Mm. And it's I didn't talk about the fact that even when you see the Euphrates dry up, the Euphrates is one of the most important rivers in the world. Mm. And it was right there in the crescent of civilization Mm. many think near wherever the garden of eden may have been Mm. you know it dries up well the euphrates was the lifeline you know it's just it dries up uh in this tribulation but we get the new river Mm. flowing out of the throne of god and uh so this whole process of of we the the people of israel and us grafted in will come through this tribulation into our promised land as God always uh, promised that we would and we return to that garden. Yeah. I think there's absolutely echoes of Jericho and if not that, I mean trumpets are instruments of victory, right? They're they're yeah. instruments of war, they're instruments of battle. And we're going to get here soon in a few weeks one of the main things that uh, John is dealing with in Revelation is Babylon, is the the conquering of these empires that have been in between the people of God and what God has promised them, just like Jericho. Right. And and so there's there's this answer to the question of God, what are you going to do about Babylon? And Babylon being this embodiment of Babylon, Egypt, uh, Syria, all of these Rome. Rome uh, you know, we could maybe keep going in history. Yeah. All of these nations that have oppressed and that have harmed God's people, uh, what are you going to do about those nations? And uh, Revelation is a is a resounding answer to that question. Mm. Um, so I think the Jericho imagery is perfect, perfect for that. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, hey, that's some literary context. Uh, we, we've already been talking about theological ideas as well. Um, but in anything else that you might want to add to the conversation that you didn't get to on Sunday? I don't know about you, my sermon was very theological on Sunday, so I don't know if there's anything I just for me. skimmed over, um, I did mention Daniel's 70 weeks in chapter 9, at, and, and finally got to that a little bit, but I wish I'd been able to set that up better mm-hmm. in the context. I think a lot of people maybe that have understand what was happening there, but I, I I didn't get to get into the detail of why um, I believe that 70th week is yet to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I laid it out a little bit, um, but I think that's Daniel and Revelation really go hand in hand, and uh, it's important to understand that I think God does have, have a timetable uh, in mind. And I love when he talks about those four angels. They were prepared for the day, yeah. the hour, hour, day, month, year. Yeah. But who really knew that hour? Yeah. The Father. Mm-hmm. The Father knows that hour, and um, and He's got a plan, and He's got a timetable. Yeah. Well, good, good. Well, uh, I think that's that's probably about it for me. Yeah. Um, I mean, we could walk through and just read Revelation eight. 9, 15, 16, and, and point out other things. But a lot of this, just full transparency, you read and you read and you read, the symbol could mean this, it could mean that, and you don't really come to a lot of conclusions. What you do come to the conclusion of, as we've already talked about, is what are these things accomplishing? It's, it's very clear what they're accomplishing. And then there is this destruction. There's this judgment. There's this torment of those who aren't in Christ. And, and we see that. Uh, the fans of Pilgrim's Progress uh, will love, right, in Revelation 9, verse 11, we get uh, Apollyon, which is the name of Satan in the Pilgrim's Progress. That's where mm-hmm. um, John Owen gets this from. So, anyways, just thought I would mention that. Anything you want to add? Any last second thoughts about what you didn't say on Sunday? Uh, no, I think I got, got to everything, but uh, I did bring up a connection to Paul. I think it's important for us to bring in these, some of these epistles from time to time, where 
he made it clear in First Corinthians, and I read this, that there's got to be a process of Jesus destroying the enemies and putting all the enemies under his feet. Mm. And then comes the end. Yeah. And that we're talking about the end. Mm -hmm. But then comes the end. But then when he puts everything under subjection to Christ's feet, then Christ himself turns around and subjects himself to the Father Mm. so that God may be all in all. Mm. And to me, that's the big point. Mm. This is where it's going, that God may be all in all. Mm -hmm. Everything is subjected to him the way it is supposed to be. And it's okay, like you said in your sermon, we ought to be proud of a God that deserves that and a God who will do it. Mm -hmm. And we want God to be all in all. Yep. Good stuff. Well, uh, we have a question. We've tried to introduce this new segment of the podcast. Right. And for a few weeks, we didn't have any questions. But we've let our listeners know and those who watch that every Sunday, if you're listening and you're watching and you think of something, hey, you didn't say this, I'd love for you to answer that on the podcast, you can go to westsidebaptist.org slash contact us, and you can submit your question there. And we have a question this week, right, Bo? We do. All right, let us, let's hear it. Sir David Goodwin. How do you decide which commentaries are worth reading? Do you have some trusted ones you keep referring back to, or do you try to get a broader perspective? Great question, David. Mm. Thank, thank you so much. You want to go first? Yeah, David, I, I think it's important. Uh, over time, you do get some trusted ones, yeah. um, and you they do, they do tend to group into what I would call uh, orthodox evangelical commentaries yeah. mm-hmm. uh, and that take seriously uh, the word of God and see it as authoritative. Mm-hmm. So I don't branch far out into others. They're not very popular. Yeah. Um, most what I really try to, to diversify are those that are uh, that really dig into the languages. Those are some really that 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 see the dig into the Greek and the Hebrew mm-hmm. and they get into a lot of those things. That's good. But, so, but I like to accompany that with some commentaries that might be a little more devotional, mm-hmm. uh, a little more talk about the meaning of it uh, and how you might apply that to life. Mm-hmm. And so there are different levels of, of commentaries. There's the more technical ones. There's the more pastoral ones. Yeah. And I like to do a blend of those. And and I use Logos Bible software that uh, when you purchase some of these things, you can uh, – it gives you a hundred commentaries. Yeah. I mean, so you look through them. You can compare for – I'll normally look at 10, 15 different commentaries um, working on a series. And uh, and you, you consult um, – around in, in in terms of you see certain uh, particular commentaries on a p- particular book may be more influential yeah more popular or better yeah than others so I might take one out of the new international commentary set um, for revelation yeah and not maybe use that for Matthew because it's better in the others so sure is that kind of how you do it yeah I think over time, you kind of gain an understanding of these are the authors I really respect and trust. And so for me, if I see an author's name, either on a commentary or a journal article or something like that around what I'm studying, I'm most likely going to read from that person. Um, But then uh, the series are really important to me. Uh, I think there are some really reputable, trusted commentary series that I'm always turning to. The Baker Exegetical Commentary Series is one. It's, you know, the yellow and blue one. Uh, There's the Zondervan uh, Exegetical Commentary Series that's very, very, uh, uh, it's it's technical in the sense of it's it's really interested in the original language and how that's working. There's the, as you mentioned, the New International Commentary on both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So, New International Commentary, N.T., on New Testament, New International Commentary, OT, Old Testament. Um, and, and so there's just series that you've you've read five, six, seven, eight commentaries in that series, and all of them are they're evangelical in their focus. They're they're academic enough that there's real substance there, and they've proved to be a resource for you in the past. And so you you go back to those. But what I would say to David is, man, one of the best things you can do is ask 
us. Yep. Like, you know, uh, I tell people all the time, we don't read in isolation. It's not like you just have to Google search good commentary on Revelation. Um, you know, ask your pastors, ask your life group leader, ask ask whoever uh, that you know is studying and, and study in community. That's one of the best. We ask each other, right? When right. we're studying, we're like, hey, what are you reading? What have you found? Uh, so that really, your best resource is your brothers and sisters in Christ, your church leadership uh, to help you point towards some good resources. Because even within series, there's some stinkers, right? Yeah, like yeah. even within the series, we really trust. I've read some from the Baker series where I'm like, nah, I'm not a fan of this. And yeah. you just put it down. Uh, so it's just kind of over time building up an understanding of who you trust, what series you trust, but then also just using your community. That's yeah. what I would say. Yeah. You're always welcome to ask. That's right. Okay, thank you, Bo, for the question, uh, the submit for reading the submission, rather. Uh, thank you, David, for the question. Any any final thoughts? We're gonna wrap up. No here. final bloopers. No final thoughts. Okay. Just hope next time I will. It won't be quite as long. There we go. But yeah. it was. Uh, and and this week we're looking at the witness. Yes. The witness in the judgment. We're looking at the two witnesses in Revelation 11, and also the scroll in, in Revelation 10. And so that's gonna be fun on Sunday. And then of course. Like always, we'll be back next week to share with you what we didn't say on Sunday.